we do a lot of um, bespoke catering. We've been doing a lot of um, baking uh, orders and things at the moment. We've done teaching and workshops similar to this before. And we also do supper clubs. So kind of a communal dining experience where everyone sits along one big table and we serve the food family style so that plates and dishes can be shared around. And they're really a lot of fun. And um, we'll be doing two towards the end of the year in October and November. Um, but today I'm going to show you how to make some uh, countertop ferments. Um, I'm not an expert in this, um, but hopefully today I can give you enough information that you feel inspired. And um, Gavin's maybe going to pop a link in the chat for, um, I've written a couple blog posts with um, links to books, online resources, and just kind of the recipes from today. So if you're, you know, not sitting with a notepad or you missed something along the way, you can always look at that later. Um, I first fermented some food. I first encountered fermented food at home um, when I was doing a master's in gastronomy, um, which was a, uh, a kind of a, it was about how food connects everything. It wasn't a cooking course, but about how food touches um, so many aspects of our lives, all aspects of our lives. Um, and I did some, some garlic carrot sticks and I was so fascinated by the flavor and like how it worked um, that I just kind of continued to practice it and share it with family and friends. And now there's pretty much always a jar of something fermented in our fridge. Um, so fermentation is vast and I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of context today. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, if you're interested, you can check out some more information on it. Um, a basic definition of fermentation is that it's transformation by microbes. Um, and it's something that we've used throughout history to preserve food, to survive, and also to transform food. Um, now in our Western culture that we have greater access to food, um, we have less need to preserve. And so fermenting food has kind of fallen out of our kitchen repertoire. Um, however, having said that, we still eat a lot of fermented food. It's just they're not made in the home, but rather industrially produced. Um, I think sometimes it's fascinating to think about the fact that, um, you know, bread and cheese are, of course, products of fermentation, but so is vinegar and chocolate and soy sauce. Um, these industrially produced versions um, are often either pasteurized at some point or inoculated with a kind of a select, um, a select range of microbes to ensure efficiency and consistency within industrial production. Um, however, that can often limit flavor. And um, today we're going to use um, wild fermentation like our ancestors would have. Um, and we're going to harness the microbes that exist um, on our vegetables, on our hands, and in the air around us. And we're going to create an environment that supports the particular microbes that we want to transform our food. Um, also, we're beginning to understand that um, making and eating these kind of live ferments can be good for our health, but um, I'm no expert in that. And if you'd like to know more about that gut health side of things, then I would direct you to um, a couple books that we can talk about later. There are also um, links to those books can be found um, on the blog post that we put up online. Um, but uh, now I'm going to show you how to make uh, some sauerkraut. So uh, sauerkraut is traditionally made with cabbage. However, um, it's a really great basic technique that can be applied to different vegetables. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the cabbage version today. Um, so I've got fresh cabbage here that I bought the co-op. Um, as you can see on the outside, there's a few kind of blemishes or you know, darker patches. Any of this we want, we want to get rid of. We wanna start with a really clean or a really fresh kind of product or vegetable that has no, yeah, no blemishes on it. Um, you, when, um, when dealing with other vegetables, or maybe if you pull this cabbage out of your garden, you want it to be free of any dirt, but you don't need to kind of like wash it or scrub it or anything under the tap. Like you want the microbes that are already living on here to do the work for you. So we want to look after them. 
so I'm going to oops, shred this cabbage. Now, all of the utensils and things that you'll be using, knife, chopping board, make sure they're clean and free of any soapy residue, but again, like they don't need to be sterilized or anything like that. So I'm just shredding this cabbage and it's really helpful to, it doesn't have to be super fine, but if it's fairly fine, then you create more surface area for the salt that we're going to add in a minute to dry out the moisture. And this can be done, I've done some really nice ones before, you don't just have to use um, white cabbage, oh, let's see there's a, there's a kind of a slightly, um, you know, a discolored part there, so I'm just going to chop that off. I don't want that to go in. Um, yeah, red cabbage is really fantastic. Um, but you can also do this with um, grated vegetables. So um, I've got a few ferments here that I'll maybe show you a little later. Um, that, you know, I've got like a grated carrot version and various, various things like that um, that can make a tasty. You know, you, I mean, you can mix vegetables as well. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to keep it as one kind of vegetable. Um, so I, over here, I've got um, a large mixing bowl. Uh, you'll need something to make the sauerkraut in. And I also have a digital scale. This is really helpful for accuracy because we need to calculate 5% um, of the weight of the cabbage to work out how much salt we're going to need. So. I put the bowl on scale and I'm going to add my, uh, my first half of the cabbage. And I'm just going to chop up the second half. So this is actually the bruised or damaged parts disrupt the fermentation. Uh, yeah, they can do. It's kind of because you're trying to encourage um, a particular type of bacteria, like or, or microbe. What you're what you're kind of doing is um, you want so the, the the microbe that we're encouraging today is lactobacillus because we want them to create lactic acid, which will sour the ferment. Um, if if we put in those blemished parts, there may be some other microbes in there that would compete against the lactobacillus and could, you know, have negative effects on our ferment, which is not what we want. So, yeah. And, yeah, and it's best to just do it with fresh veg. Like, I think I've tried it with maybe a cabbage that was looking a little bit sad and it just didn't want to, it just didn't taste very nice in the end. Okay. People complimented you on your knife skills. Thank you. <laughs> Helps to have a good sharp knife and a steady board. And these um these slightly chunkier core parts, I'm just cutting those a little bit finer. Okay. So So we're looking at around, let's see, 800, 870, yes, 870 grams of cabbage. So now what I want to do is work out what 5% of that is and weigh out that amount of salt. I'm just going to wash my hands. Well, Gavin works out what 5% of 87 is, 870 is 43. 43. Yeah, yeah 40, 43 will do. Um, so here I've got a tub of, you really want to use pure sea salt. Um, we get, we buy our sea salt online, um, just because it's easy, and the ingredients are literally fine sea salt. Um, you, you don't want anything that has, that is iodized or has any anti-caking agents in it, 
as that can also interrupt the fermentation. Um, so yeah, I would, and, and it doesn't have to be fine sea salt, but the finer it is, the easier it disperses and the quicker you can kind of uh, salt your kraut. So I'm just in a small dish, I'm gonna weigh out uh, 43 grams of salt. Okay. Uh, and, you know, these, this, this method, while it's kind of a general method, it's also kind of like the way that I like to do it. So what I like to do is I add salt as I go and I don't necessarily use the full 5% as long as I use... I'm asking what type of salt. Oh, is. it's a... Uh, I think we buy it on Amazon. Yeah, Tree of Life. Yeah. Um, so I've added a pinch of salt, and now I get to do the fun part, which is squeezing the cabbage. And you really just have to kind of massage it very aggressively. <laughs> it's quite fun. It sounds like walking through compacted snow. Um, oh, actually, I might add some mustard seed to this. So, I mean, you can, you can leave this just, um, just as a plain kraut, or you can add other herbs and seasonings. I'm gonna add a little mustard seed, because I like mustard. And Sorry, Hannah. It, it, Karen, <laughs> um, they, they, someone was asking, is it sea salt that you're using? It is sea salt. I, yeah, it's sea salt. Thank you. That's okay. So the other thing is that it's really helpful when choosing your bowl to choose something that's not too high-sided because you need to get your hands inside it. And also you want something that has quite a sturdy base. This is a little rocky. And I'm going to... I'm going to taste this and see how salty it is. Okay, I think that can take more salt. So you can use all of the salt that's in this bowl here, but you don't have to. It's just that you wouldn't really want it to go above 5%. So that's, that's why I like to, to weigh it, but then kind of go until my personal preference. So there's a couple of people um, commenting, do you have a preferred brand of salt or is it just kind of what, whatever, uh, that, that particular one? Um, I mean, we, we like... Go ahead. Um, we like, sorry. <laughs> no, you, you go. <laughs> we like the Tree of Life brand just because you can, we like, we kind of buy it in bulk um, off Amazon. I think it's like six bags in a box or something. And it's, um, and because it's fine, it disperses well, and it's free of any, any kind of anti-caking agents or other stuff that can be in, I mean, like, it, it's really fascinating. Like, after this, you know, go look at the, the bottle or packet of salt in your cupboard and, and actually see what's listed in the ingredients, because I think you'd be surprised how many salts contain other things. Yeah, there's a couple of so. people commented that kosher salt is good. Um, yes, because kosher salt is not iodized. I see. So, um, and, and then someone a, has yeah. also asked, um, they don't have a large scale for measuring, for weighing the veg. What would be the dangers of guessing the amount of salt? Um, I would say they're... The only danger, if to, to use that word, would be guessing the amount of salt, would be that perhaps your ferment could develop some mold on top or something, but you'd be able to see that. And if that happens, you just get rid of it. You know, you just have to throw it out, which is a shame, but which is also why it's good to start small. Um, to be honest, I often guess the amount of salt to taste. I just salt it until it's at the very kind of edge of my personal salt preference, if you like. <laughs> um, you know, like, I like, like, just make it quite salty to your own taste. And if, and if you find that it, for whatever reason, it doesn't really work, then you can add some more next time. Um, it's, I mean, like, fermentation is a lot of, like, trial and error. Um, and 
you'll get more comfortable with it each time you try it. So definitely, you know, I think don't be afraid, just, you know, know that if you do get some molds on top, you're just gonna have to throw it out. And really quickly, you'll also know what the signs of positive fermentation are, and I will talk about those in a little bit as well. Okay, so I'm oh, getting a pretty big mess here. Just to come in, come in again on that, someone has suggested the, the rule of thumb that they use is two teaspoons per cabbage. Uh, I mean, yeah, like that, if that works for them, but I mean, like I've had really big cabbages before, you know, we're also very small ones. So, I mean, as a rule of thumb, totally. And that's the thing too, is if you start looking online, different people will have different kind of um, rules that they like to use. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of, especially like American programs that'll say like, yeah, like two pounds of cabbage to this much salt or whatever, but I just find the grams work well for me. Um, okay, so if Gavin can come in a little bit again, uh, you might be able to see like how wet it's beginning to look. So that's just from salting and scrunching. And I'm gonna keep going a little bit longer, but you might be able to see it's getting juicy. And I mean, that hasn't taken me that long. You know, maybe the same amount of time or less than of needing bread. Uh, the other thing you can do, um, which especially if I'm making two or three ferments at once, is I might stop here and let this sit for 10 minutes and the salt will continue to draw the moisture. Um, saving you a little bit of work, but I'm just gonna keep going, pardon me, for today. But yeah, let's see how much is it. So it's also like cooling in the bottom of the bowl there. So we're getting really close. Once once there's a good couple of tablespoons in the bottom for, for a single cabbage like this, I'm generally quite happy. Ah. Oh, it's great. You know, if you're ever feeling frustrated, <laughs> you know, just make some sauerkraut. So, so to clarify, like, um, someone was asking, it, it's 5% of the quantity of all of the vegetables if you were using other vegetables as well. So the weight yes, is maximum. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like a total veg ratio of 5% salt to total veg. Um, and, it, and also, like, if, if, you know, if people can access that that link or like our website, like it's it's written down as well if that if that's helpful. Okay, I'm gonna rinse my hands. All right, and now we are going to pack this into our jar. So I like to use these jars. Um, mainly just personal preference. It's what I what I had to hand when I started. And what I've gotten used to. Um, so I'm gonna take a handful of cabbage and put it into the bottom of this clean but not sterilized jar. And you just kind of pack it into the bottom. You can also do this, oh yeah that's the other thing I like about these jars is I can fit my hand inside them. Um, that's really helpful if your jars, you know, like you don't have to go out and buy these jars, like if what you have does not fit your hand inside, you can use like a rolling pin or if you have a potato masher that fits anything you can push in there to pack it down okay so the other thing that um is good is that you don't want to fill a jar to the brim you want to leave a little bit of headspace because one of the byproducts and one of the good signs that fermentation is taking place in a positive way is that gas will be produced, which of course will, will kind of force the cabbage up a little bit and also the brine. Um, so you just want a little headspace to make sure that your jars don't completely overflow every time you make something or every night. <laughs> okay, so pretty close and I've got so I've got a little cabbage and water in the bottom of this bowl 
I'm just gonna pour this on top of all of that now. So everything that was in the bowl is now going into the jar. Okay. And so as you can see, if I push down, the level of the brine is coming up over the top of the cabbage, which is totally perfect. That's what we want because one of the rules of thumb in fermentation is that if it is under brine, it will be fine. So that's what we're aiming for. And the other thing that you need to do to make sure that everything stays submerged is you want to put a weight on top. Um, and also, like, this is my personal preference. Um, so I like to use these small glass dishes. Um, these are actually from um, like a dessert pot that you can buy in the supermarket called Goo, G-U. Um, and I, they come in these glass dishes and they fit absolutely perfectly inside. So that, and you know, with a little pressure to push down, the brine rises up. And what that means, what, what I like about these is that there's a very small surface area that oxygen is touching um, because the lactobacillus that we're creating the environment for, they do not like oxygen, but things like molds do. So having a small area like this decreases the likelihood that it'll turn moldy. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this bowl, wash my hands. So there's been a few, few other comments popping up um, yeah. saying just about the percentages of weight to work out your salt and um, for the ratio. So someone said that is it the lower you go with the salt, the less crisp the veg vegetables will be and there's a higher risk of getting mold? Yeah, I would say that's probably pretty accurate. Um, that's, that's what I've understood as well. Um, the salt does help keep things kind of crispy and crunchy and yeah I think it's the salt it's, it's almost kind of like um, sometimes I like to think of it as like it's a pet like you have a pet here and you want to make them happy and comfortable and you want them to have a lot of fun and lactobacillus which is the microbe that we want in here doing its thing um, is likes a salty environment whereas lots of other things don't so the lower the salt environment the yeah like the greater likelihood that something else might also have a good time and take over um five percent is not like five percent is my preference but i the next one i'm going to show you um well yeah five, and also five percent is easy to work out but i any i do anything between three and five percent depending on how I'm feeling or what I have. <laughs> Someone's asked if you could weigh how much salt you've got left from the bag. Yes, I actually meant to say that. Yeah, you can weigh what you have left. I've probably used about half to over to just over half of this, so probably about three percent. It's just that I don't like to go over five percent, um, especially in a kraut because, um, yeah, just personal preference. Um, so the other thing that's quite important that I encourage you to do, that's easy not to do, is to label your, um, your ferments. You'll be amazed. You'll think it's been on your counter for two weeks and it's been four days. Um, and um, it's also just, it's just helpful because if you suddenly open your jar after it's fermented and you've had it in the fridge for two weeks and you're like, this is delicious, but I don't even remember what's in it now. So it's just a nice way. Um, of keeping track of things and the date is the 11th so I will label this pop it on there and the other thing is is I don't like to close the lid I like to leave the lid open um, if you are worried about flies or if um, I, I never seem to have issues with this but I know some people do with flies or, or things like that are attracted to it so you can put a, a cloth over it, like a tea towel or something um, I don't find I ever need to and I like to keep it open as well because um, if you close it with the rubber seal the gas that's produced can create pressure and you have to burp it which is fine it's just it's just how I like to do it um, so I'm gonna set this to one side um, and I'm gonna clear my board a little bit and then I will show you how to do another kind of 
ferment that is also very adaptable, um, which is kind of loosely referred to as like a brine ferment. That's, that's what I've been calling it. Um, so I've got a bowl of veggies that are sort of prepped. Um, I'm gonna make a, like a jardinera, which is a kind of, almost like an Italian condiment, I guess, really. Um, and um, once well, I've... Sh can you tell people how long you usually leave it before yes, you use it? Yeah, Sorry. I was just about <laughs> to say that. Um, so any ferment you wanna, you wanna keep, well, see, uh, like this is all personal preference. Like you really need to smell and taste and watch and look at your ferment, like check on it every day. For something that you're doing, these countertop ferments um, that are happening at room temperature, uh, you probably want to leave it anywhere between five and 10 days, seven and 10 days, depending on how warm your house is. Um, I actually have a crowd here that I made yesterday um, that I will show you, like, so, I don't, uh, can you see that quick close? So the brine is slightly cloudier, which is great. That's what we're looking for. And also if I press down on my weight, can you see some of the air bubbles coming up? Yeah. So that's also a great sign of fermentation. Um, I like to leave my kraut for about seven days. It'll also discolor. So again, if I hold these two side by side, you can see like this, the older one is slightly more yellow and it will continue to kind of get yellow, more yellow. Um, and once, once you're content with the flavor, um, you can close it and put it in your fridge or decant it into a smaller jar and put it in the fridge. And putting it in the fridge will slow down the fermentation by a lot, but it won't stop it completely. So if you leave your jar of sauerkraut unopened in the fridge for two months, chances are there will be a little pressure in there and it might be a little bit fizzy, um, but you can keep them in the fridge almost indefinitely. They may develop mold. If they do, then just, you know, like you'll need to get rid of it. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, keep, they keep a pretty long time. Um, and I, I would say the same rule applies for this brine ferment that I'm going to show you. Um, you know, just a couple, you know, up, up to two weeks on the counter and then in the fridge for as long as it takes you to eat them, I guess. There's been another couple of questions coming in just about the previous one that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, just, will it taste salty when it's, um, once it's had, you know, the fermentation time? It will taste salty. Um, and that is why kind of one of the, the way I like to think about fermented foods is as a condiment because they can be quite strong flavored. Like they'll be tart, they'll be salty. Um, they'll be a little bit funky, you know, sometimes like it can take time to get used to the flavor um, And you may not like it either, which is fine. You know, you could just try something else like you might not like sauerkraut But you might like fermented carrots or something like that um, but yeah, they will taste salty and um, Yeah, so don't you know, so think of them as almost like you know, you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't eat, like, a huge plate of pickles, um, so you probably won't eat a huge plate of, um, you know, fermented food. Um, it's definitely, like, a seasoning element, um, and that's actually often how it's been used throughout history. Things like soy sauce and miso um, are, yeah, are, you know, we think of those more as, like, seasonings than something that we would be eating a lot of. And um, there was another question about the um, the process of getting the brine out, the water out. If there's not enough to cover the in the jar, would you take it out and knead it a bit more to get more moisture out, or could you just add a bit of water to it to make sure that you've got the the covered um, all of it covered? If if the brine isn't rising above the level of the cabbage, then I would just mix up a little salt water brine and, and pour it on top. I've, I think I've had to do that once before and it's, it's totally fine. Um, yeah, that's probably the best, the best way to deal with that. Um, just make sure it's between three and 5%, salt, you know, salt solution. Um, and the, there was a couple of other um, just comments about the process of getting the weight down. So somebody mm -hmm. suggested like use, well, 
you know, they use just as alternatives and um, mm -hmm. using a bag with baked beans in it as the weight. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, this is like, yeah, this is the thing is like, there's lots of different, I mean, like, I, I think I once unsuccessfully used um, like, I, like a bag of stones, like I wrapped stones in cling film. I mean, it didn't work, but you know, like you can be quite creative with, with what you choose to, um, to weigh down. You can also, I was going to show you, um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit faffy, um, is you can take a, like a, a, a plastic bag that seals very well and fill it with a little bit of water and then put it inside another plastic bag. And, and kind of push it into the jar slightly. And it's kind of great because it means that you get even less like surface area touching the air. Um, but you just have to be careful that the bag doesn't break or anything like that. Um, you, you, you know, like you'll find what you, what you like to use, essentially. And then there's a couple of other suggestions. I don't know if these two are maybe the same things. Um, Kilner sets with gas holes and a ceramic weight. So I've never seen that myself. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I've, I think there's lots of there's lots of like kit out there that you can buy. Um, and you know, like I've I think personally I've just I found this combination really quickly, and I found it worked really well. So I haven't I haven't kind of ventured beyond that because. I have a need to buy more stuff. You know, I think that's the other thing is sometimes like they want, you know, they want you to buy loads of things. So, you know, it's a, it's about finding what, what you have success with. But yeah, these are all valid suggestions. Okay. Oops. There's, there's been lots of other questions come in. So what <laughs> I'm going to do is I'll let, I'll let you talk through the demo that you're doing just now okay. and we can come back to a lot of these questions because we could probably answer the, yeah, someone's asking what you're putting in the jar. So we'll go with that, those questions. What, what are you doing now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm, I'm working on, um, yes, this kind of jardinera, this kind of, I think it's, yeah, like an Italian condiment, if you like. And what I like about it is that you can use whatever kind of veg you've got around. And it's a, I feel like it's a good starter one because, you know, maybe you'll discover that you really dislike fermented peas, but that you love fermented kohlrabi. So this is a bit of kohlrabi from our garden that I just chopped up. I've got some beautiful different colored beans and um, some carrots that are in the bottom. I really like fresh chili and garlic, so I'm gonna pack this one with chili and garlic. And what, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm layering this up in this jar. You can mix it in a bowl, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's, it really doesn't matter. I'm just gonna bruise and peel this garlic. Um, and then, so in the same, so before we wanted 5% of the weight of the cabbage, because we're making the brine, what we're going to do is 5% of the water that, um, that is in here, like 5% salt of the water. So this is a little sweet. That was a chili pepper. This is like a sweet pepper. Okay. And again, you know, I'm purposefully kind of, making sure there's a little like room at the top. I don't want to overfill this. So I'm going to take this to the scale. Oops. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to take this to the scale and um, zero it so that it, you know, it's at zero. And I'm going to pour water on top until everything is just submerged. So we're at 230, 230 mils. And then I'm going to pour, well, actually I'm going to, 5% of 230 is 12, 12 ish grams. Um, so I'm going to weigh out 12 grams of salt. Okay, there we go. And then I'm going to, without pouring all the vegetables out, I'm going to pour the water back in here. So that way we have like a really accurate 5%. Um, and stir until the salt dissolves. Sorry. 
which again, this is why I like this fine sea salt, just because it dissolves really quickly. So, yep, that's pretty good. And I'm gonna pour this back over all those veg. And the other thing I realized the other day that works is I've got a I've got a Nutella jar um, that can be used as a weight, you know, so just another alternative, but I'm gonna stick with I'm gonna stick with these. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, like, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, I'll give it a quick label. And so this also, you know, you'll watch, because there's more brine in this one, you'll be able to see how cloudy the brine gets as fermentation takes place. And, you know, you'll be able to see the bubbles rising up as well. Those are two really good signs. Um, if, the, if they're, if that's not happening, it could be because, your kitchen is quite cool and it just takes a little longer. Um, but you know, sniff it, like it should, <laughs> like it, it should smell, it should begin to smell sour as well. Um, so there was a, an interesting question come in about, um, what about chlorinated water? Um, that is a good question. I never, had any problems using tap water, but I think that's also because we have really great tap quality tap water here. Um, and I've I've seen recipes before where they talk about using like spring water or filtered water. And um, what I would recommend is that if you, pardon me, if you make something with tap water and it's really not working, like after a couple goes, then try using a spring water or you know, something that's less, yeah, like less chlorinated, but it's, it's never been an issue for me. So, um, if, yeah, if you're lucky you live in Scotland, then you'll probably be all right. <laughs> yeah, we've got very soft water up here, so, um, yeah, it's probably makes things a wee bit easier from that side of things. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions over what, um, it does always have to be fresh vegetables. Can you use can you use frozen vegetables that have been defrosted? Can you use cooked vegetables, or does it um, always have to be fresh? I always use fresh, but um, I would say if you're if you're starting out, like if this is your first time encountering like fermenting at home, just use fresh vegetables. Um, I've never tried frozen. I have heard people say that you can add small amounts of, like small amounts of cooked things, um, but it's it's um, yeah that that's a world I'm not that familiar with. Um, one of the um, people or authors that I would recommend looking up um, is a guy called Sandor Katz, who has a book called The Art of Fermentation, which explores ferments from all over the world and. I think he talks about using various like cooked foods and things, but I've never, I've never tried that. I, I've used like raisins before in some ferments, but you know, small amounts. I still have a lot of like, like a large proportion of fresh vegetables in there. Um, but um, I can, are there, are there a couple more questions right now or should I show you a couple other types of ferments I've done? Um, we can maybe go through some of the questions that had come in from from the last one that kind of apply to this as well. Yeah. So once um, once you put it in the freezer to help it make it last, does it always have to be submerged under the liquid? Um, in the fridge. Do you mean in the fridge? Yeah, in the fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, like yes, it's helpful. I mean, I I have a ferment here, like a carrot. This one was carrot and ginger and nigella seed and turmeric, and it's very dry for whatever reason. I mean, there's, there is, I can see there's moisture in the bottom, but it's not submerged. And I mean, I've had that almost a month in the fridge and it's fine. Um, I, you know, like if it's not submerged in brine, it just probably won't keep as long. Um, but again, that's why making small amounts and eating them quickly is, is quite a nice way to do things. And some someone else had suggested about ginger as a flavouring as well. So you've obviously just mentioned it in that one. So um. yeah, it's it's really nice. Um, you can either in this one I had it I grated it in, but you can also just bruise it or slice it if it's um 
you know, in a, in a brine style ferment instead of a, whoops, instead of a, a kraut. Um. Uh, and another question about um, cooking the ferments. If mm -hmm. you're cooking it, will it, it, it'll lose some of the health benefits associated? Um, it can do, yes. Like in terms of the, the kind of like the live microbes that you'll be ingesting, like when you cook those, you will kill them. However, um, in my kind of research for this, I was also reading about how, um, you know, one way to think of ferments is almost, sounds a bit weird, but like pre-digestion. So these microbes, even though like, uh, like, yeah, these microbes are kind of working on this food and releasing mineral, minerals and nutrients. Um, and so it makes it easier, it can make it easier for your body to absorb them. Um, so, you know, the benefit isn't just from eating it live, like, actually, I, the other night we had a curry and this carrot and ginger one, I cooked down in a frying pan with a little teaspoon of sugar and made a kind of like sweet sour chutney thing, which was super delicious, um, and really tasty. So, you know, I think, yeah, totally, if you want to cook them, cook them and, you know, they'll still be delicious and, and tasty. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, and there was a question about to ferment beans. Uh, sorry, I lost it for a second. Could I use fresh or cooked? Is that possible? Uh, beans like like these, like green beans. I think it oh. maybe if if that's what you mean, um, then I would like I would use fresh. I think cooked because the thing I think the the major thing with cooked is that. Again, in the same way of like cooking your ferment, you're killing any microbes that live on the surface by cooking it. So then when you go to make it, you're starting with a lot less and there's a greater likelihood that it can go in a direction you don't want it to. Um, that's why, I think that's really why fresh vegetables are best, but why you can get away with adding a few cooked things. But again, like if you're just beginning, I would stick with really basic vegetables and kind of, you know, don't don't overcomplicate it for yourself. That's great, thank you. And um, some someone's asking if you if you sell your merchandise, your lovely aprons that you have. <laughs> they're they're saying I'm sure it's been a challenging year for you so far with your business. So uh, yeah, it, it has been a little bit. We we've definitely been missing our supper clubs, um, and we we had a pretty busy year planned actually. Um, but luckily most of that, most of all the kind of the catering and kind of fun event bookings that we were doing have, uh, have rebooked for next year. So we're almost going to have like a, um, a, you know, a second go in 2020, if you like. But we, we don't currently sell these aprons, but <laughs> if you are interested, <laughs> let us I'm know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so coming back to the actual fermentation, um, do you ever put fresh herbs from the garden in? And also, would you rather use organic vegetables? Does it actually matter? Um, I do use fresh herbs from the garden sometimes. I think um, I'm trying to think what I've used in the past. Like I've done, I've done a kraut before with fresh dill in it. Um, I don't, uh, and I think I've done something with rosemary as well. I actually I meant to put bay leaf in the charbonara. Um, I quite like adding bay to stuff. Um, and using organic vegetables. I mean. Yes, I would say, like, if you have that choice, if you have that option, like, I mean, if you have homegrown stuff, totally use that. You know, in the kind of hierarchy of what you want to use, homegrown, you know, then organic, and then kind of whatever fresh veg you can get your hands on. Um, I think, you know, the, the benefits of organic are that, yeah, you, you have a, a very, like, reduced amount of kind of pesticides, but also in the terms of, like, the externalities of, the cost of our food, organic, is better, you know, for the environment and things like that. Um, for the for the microbial, you know, for the microbes in the soil too. It's a whole other world if you're interested. Um. <laughs> okay, another question that came in, um, which we can leave till the end if you want. If there's anything else you're wanting to go over, um, is a kimchi recipe. Yes. So kimchi, for those who don't know, is like a, a Korean fermented cabbage. Um, traditionally, it's made with a specific kind of cabbage and um, I think often uh, 
a Korean fermented chili paste called gochujang. Um, and you treat the cabbage slightly differently from a sauerkraut. Like you, I think you kind of put it in a brine and then you take it out and it's, it's I, I've never made it in the traditional way before. However, I have used the sauerkraut method to make a kind of kimchi style sauerkraut where I scrunched, salted, and squeezed the cabbage in exactly the same way as this, except I also made um, a paste of fresh chilies, ginger, and garlic. And then after, to save your hands, after everything is nice and juicy, I just kind of folded that through and put it in a jar and fermented it. Um, you know, I, I don't have a specific recipe for that. I really just kind of had to, I think I had two cabbages and four chilies and a head of garlic or something like that. So uh, it's worth, you know, like it's worth playing with. I, I left, um, also I think traditionally they put um, some kind of fish sauce in it um, and I left that out of mine, I think. Um, but you know, you can totally play around with it. I actually, at Christmas time, um, a great way, so this is the other thing is like, how do you then eat these once you've made them? A great thing that I did, I was so pleased with it. Um, is I made, I made a kind of kimchi style sauerkraut and then essentially made like a, a bread dough that I rolled out and put the kimchi in like on the dough along with some cheese and rolled it up and made like cheesy kimchi swirls. They were, they were really great. I was super pleased with those. <laughs> definitely need to make those again. That sounds delicious. It's definitely making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that's all the questions. Oh, your sister's commenting that the bread was delicious. <laughs> um, um, can you transfer? Oh, sorry. Uh, can you transfer uh, the sauerkraut to screw top jars to store in the fridge without risks? Um, yes, that is that is generally what I do. Um, only because I only have a few of these bigger jars, and it's also easier to share um, your ferments as well, which is totally something that I wanted to say, which is that, you know, if you're, if you're going to be doing this, please, you know, share a taste with your neighbor. Like, you know, if you make something that you think is really delicious, share it with your friends and family, because it's a great way to kind of experience these foods. Because personally, it wasn't until um, I, I was eating all of my friends' ferments that I was like, okay, I have to, like, I have to make more of these. Um, and I think it's also, the flavor can be, some people don't enjoy it at first, or it can take a little time to, to really love it. Um, so, you know, by sharing it and tasting what other people are making, it's a really, really great way of, of you know, just, just having something to share with other people. Um, a couple other things you can, so, so, you know, this is a almost a month old or just over a month old sauerkraut. So just, you know, checking out the color there that's the color you're looking for. Or don't, you know, like, don't be surprised if it turns a kind of murky green <laughs> compared to this bright green. Um, I also have a kohlrabi, sweet, and pink peppercorn one. Again, just grated vegetables, salted in the same way as the kraut. And then another kind of brine, um, quite a nice, you know, really fascinating flavor is doing cloves of garlic. In, in a brine like we've done this jardinera. Um, it's really like, it, like the flavors that can be created are just fascinating. Um, I've also got some beans by themselves. These were purple beans, like kind of like these ones I have today. Sadly, they lost their purple, but then the brine turned purple. So it's quite, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's a lot of, I, I definitely, when I come through in the morning and make my cup of tea, I always check on my ferments. And it's, it's fun to see what they've done overnight and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do you ever ferment fruit? Um, I have dabbled in fermenting some fruit. Um, one of my, um, I did an apple and cabbage sauerkraut one time, but I found it, I, I really, I think I didn't enjoy that one very much. Um, but I've, I fermented, yeah, I think it's, I have done a little bit, but I don't feel like I've cracked it quite yet. I think because of the um, sugar levels and things like that, it can, it doesn't, it doesn't kind of, I don't know, 
yeah and this is the thing is like it takes time to to get used to it and also like you know i think i fermented some rhubarb at the beginning of the year that i still have in the fridge because i don't know what to do with it so <laughs> if anyone has ideas <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a couple of other questions. Some, someone commented, garlic usually turns blue in, in a brine. Is that normal? Yes, that is totally normal. It's totally fine. Um, I read about that a couple weeks ago. I can't quite remember why it happens, but yeah, it's totally safe to eat. Someone, um, someone commented, Jim, Jim's commented, that it depends on how the garlic was growing, depending on if it will or won't. So. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Mandy, hi Mandy, <laughs> uh, do you ever add sugar? I bought a jar of fermented vegetables this week and it was surprisingly sweet. Um, it probably, I mean, have, have a look on the label of, you know, to see if they've added sugar, but I would be surprised if they did. And it can just be the natural sugars in the vegetables. Like, I think, you know, even though we, you know, we think of vegetables as savory things, like, you know, a lot of them are really sweet, but like peas, you know? Yeah, and Mandy's also suggesting try, try adding it to gin. For rhubarb fermented, add it to gin. Gin and oh. rhubarb are all the yeah. well, I was thinking maybe I need to just, um, you know, turn it into like a rhubarb chutney or something like that. Or, you know, yeah, just play with it. Um, but, uh... Yeah, what else? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I may have missed out or Yeah, what um what's been the most disastrous thing that you've tried to ferment? Oh, uh, I mean, I guess I like I've had ferments that just are just like pure mold furry tops and it's just really sad to have to kind of like chuck it in your compost bin. Um and, and you know, really to begin with, I if if it develops mold, it's just Oh yeah, oh yeah, this is what I meant to say. If in doubt, chuck it out. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're dealing, it's, it, it's, it's a, what am I trying to say? You know, it's, it's one of these things that's complex but simple, you know, and you're better safe than sorry. Like, it's just a cabbage. It's more important than your health or anything like that. So please, if, if they develop any mold, just get rid of them and, um, yeah, if in doubt, chuck it out. And if it's under brine, it will be fine. <laughs> the great sayings. A um, couple <laughs> of other questions. Can you reuse the brine if you've got any liquid left over for starting your next batch? Um, you could use a teaspoon or two of brine to kind of almost like a starter to, to, get, to get your ferment going, but I wouldn't put, I wouldn't, you know, use it as the only brine because you know, the the balance of salt will have changed and things like that. Um, but the brines can be really nice. Um, you know, like you can, I've used, um, I've used, if I have a really tasty brine, sometimes I'll use it as um, like part of a dressing for something or, you know, you, because it's tart and salty, you can use it like you might use um, a, a vinegar or any kind of like salty seasoning. Um, just to add depth of flavor and that kind of, you know, balance out, especially if, if the dish is quite rich and then it's quite a nice, quite a nice balance. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, you know, you, you could use it as a starter, but don't, don't just put like a whole bunch of new veg in there. Okay, great. Um, now, have you ever added water kefir granules or liquid? Um, I've never used, um, or made water kefir before. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question for you. <laughs> it's fine. And someone's also asking about kombucha. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are they just asking what it is, or? Just, they would love to learn more about it. It's maybe ah. one for another day though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I do, I do have my, um, my little jar of, of, uh, kombucha over on the side here. It's, um, it's one of the ferments that I'm just not a big, uh, juice drinker and it's, a. Uh, and it's, a. Uh, I just, I, I make it and I never end up drinking it. So it's not something I've, uh, made a lot of but um 
but it is it is tasty and it is also fun to make and it's a little bit weird <laughs> um but yes maybe maybe one for another day but also like you know if you let me grab a book um if you are interested in knowing more about like especially like, specific types of ferments that i recommend checking out either of these two books this one has a lot of like recipes but it also explores things like um like koji and vinegar making and this so, thing see the yeah author um and it's quite um it's quite experimental whereas this book is less less kind of like straight up recipe i mean it does have recipes in it but it's also kind of like like a world history of fermentation like it covers a lot of stuff um but these are two books that you know i turn to quite a lot if i if I need more, um, <laughs> if I need, if I need some questions answered, um, and if you, I mean, like, these books are, ah, so my favorite book, I lent to a friend recently, who might be watching, who might not be, um, and it's called The Hidden Half of Nature, and if you attended the, any of the Grow Your Own workshops that I, and you're interested in fermentation as well, then definitely check out The Hidden Half of Nature, because it looks at the microbial roots of life and looks at microbes in our food and our gut as well as in our soil and how they're kind of all connected. Um, but if you want to know more about microbes and like health, nutrition, gut stuff, um, both of these books discuss those kind of things and it's really fascinating. Um, so definitely, and, and also, um, you know, if you don't want to be going and buying loads of books, go to YouTube. Like, lots of these people do talks and things like that that will give you often the gist of what their books are about. Well, what we can maybe do is um, send an email out to everyone that's been signed up um, to Eventbrite that we can send out the book list um, and hopefully get it that way. And then we'll also pop it up on the Facebook event too. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are having to, to go because it is just after five. But um, thank you very much for joining if you do have to leave just now. There's just been another couple of questions um, popped up. Coming back to the um, kombucha, mm -hmm. maybe my pronunciation's not very good. <laughs> um, does anybody know what happens to the caffeine levels when you brew it? Oh, I do not know. Actually, I could not answer that one for you, but maybe someone else who's watching could, I'm not sure. And oh yeah, um, someone suggested that you should maybe think about doing a, a workshop when we're all allowed to, um, yes, to, to well, visit people in places. Yeah, well, do you know, I actually, over last winter, I was like, I wonder, I wonder if people around here would be interested in, in, in a doing a workshop and that, you know, like maybe I could put one on because I actually did, um, gosh, was it last June? I think it was last June, I went um, to the West Highland College campus in Fort William and I did a little, um, a day where I taught the teachers some new stuff um, and one of the things we did was I taught them how to do some fermentation and it was such a fun afternoon and I was like, yeah, this would be a great thing to do as a workshop. So if people are interested in the local area in coming to a workshop, you know, please um, send us an email. We have um, kind of a contact us page on our website or, you know, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Like, you know, just let us know because it would be great to, to see what kind of demand there is for it. And, you know, if people want to know more than, than what I've shared today. Um, I think Gavin's sharing a link to our, um, our blog and our website um, again right now. Um, up now. Um, so <laughs> there's the, uh, someone responded about the caffeine um, I think I, I can't see it oh yeah so one person says that the caffeine stays the same but then other another comment says it's lost and also the sugar so a bit of conflict there um, I guess it's kind of like the same with a lot of our other events that we've had you know there's going to be lots of different ways to do things and lots of different information out there so yeah. it is just like having a look and seeing things and I guess trying yeah. as well and um, well absolutely I mean like you know I know that the tannins in tea are quite important in kombucha um but you know there's nothing to stop you if you have a scoby like you know try using a 
caffeine free tea bag or you know caffeine free tea i don't i mean i don't know but you know this is what's nice is that it's an opportunity for experimentation um and also um what was the other thing about kombucha i was going to say um oh to do with the sugar being lost it, it the because the sugar is there as food for the yeast the you know like the sugar will deplete but will not necessarily you know depending on if you drink it very young then there might be more sugar than when you, if you drink it quite um you know older essentially yeah no that makes sense um yeah, the, there was someone asking about how long the pickles and brine will last. Um. Um, I mean, they'll continue very slowly to change flavor. So if you're really loving the flavor, then I advise you to eat them quicker. But um, I mean, they, they can last a really long time. In fact, I will get something out of the fridge that I've had for quite a while. <laughs> We've also had some people commenting that I've, um, I'm not sure if they've gone now or, or um, are still there, but San Francisco, we've had someone from, um, there was another Pennsylvania, USA as well. So, <laughs> so these, these are um, wild garlic buds um, that I fermented, not this January or March, but the previous one. And I've had, so I've had them for over a year. And they're really tart, but really delicious. Um, and these have kept fine. So, you know, it's under brine. It's been fine. They taste great. Um, I think, so here, oh gosh, here I've got a jar of pickles. But as you can see, I've, because I shared these pickles and I put some brine in a different jar, the, the brine level has come below. I know I need to either get these under the brine or I need to eat them soon. Because that is where mold is likely to occur. So, yeah, and I mean, maybe this dry kraut I'll eat quicker, but, you know, I've got a couple that are more wet, so I think they'll just keep a bit better, you know. Again, you know, you're, you might you might find that you just eat them quicker, or, and, and, and yeah, if a half jar of kraut gets a little mold on top, then, you know, sometimes that just happens. Some, someone's just asking, your wild garlic buds, are these ramps? Yes. I'm glad you <laughs> Yes. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> These are great, like a, a great kind of capery replacement, like in a tartar sauce or like a salsa verde. It'd be so good. Oh, also the jardinera. I mean, I haven't really mentioned very much, but if you're interested, you know, like ways of eating these things, like this jardinera that I made last week, very similar to the one I made for you guys today. Um, I really have enjoyed it. Um, finely diced, uh, finely diced and served through rice as like a relish, like on a burger or something. Like there's really a lot of, like once you start eating them, you'll find they go great with like fried eggs, things like that. So, so good. Oh, great. Um, okay, so lots of people are just saying thank you that they've really okay. enjoyed it. Learned new things. People, um, never done um, fermentation before, but have done pickling, so quite happy, gonna give it a go now. So that's great, great to hear that everyone's um, willing to give it a shot. Yeah, lo lots of comments there, so just thank you very much. I don't think there's any more questions coming in, so that's, okay. um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, and thank you, Gavin, um, yeah, for, well. for doing it as well. Um, yeah, well, I think we're all gonna go and get some dinner and be slightly disappointed that we don't have anything fermented to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, I wish I could share with you or let people taste things because that is what's so exciting about it. And, you know, so if, if I, when I do some, some real workshops, there'll be loads of things to taste. Yeah, lots of people saying, um, can't wait for supper clubs and yeah. oh, definitely great. interested in classes. And I'm definitely oh. on in that same boat as well because, yeah, we loved your um, supper clubs that you've done. So <laughs> Thank you.